Acts 4, verses 1 to 22. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed, standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everybody living in Jerusalem knows they have done an outstanding miracle, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we've seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray as we start. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the book of Acts that tells us of the acts of the apostles, Lord, but also, more importantly, is telling us of the continued acts of Jesus. Lord, risen, ascended, seated on high, the commander-in-chief, the one pulling the strings, and continuing to extend your kingdom rule and reign over the face of the earth, Lord. Thank you for this passage, and we pray, Holy Spirit, you'd come and enlighten our minds and our hearts to hear and receive all that you have to say to us this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I want to talk today on what it looks like to live like an apostle. Everyone enjoying the book of Acts? the last few weeks. Isn't it exciting going through this book on the back of the Gospels? uh, Jesus has just risen from the dead. He's done Bible studies and appeared to them for 40 days. Then he's ascended to heaven and uh, they've had a prayer meeting in the upper room for 10 days, waiting for the gift of the Father, the promise that Jesus spoke of to be clothed with power from on high. Then the day of Pentecost comes, the Spirit fills the church and it goes out into the world to preach the gospel and continue the ministry of Jesus. And they turn the known world upside down. And the exciting thing for us, the relevant thing for us, is that we are called to continue that ministry in this day and age, right here in Notting Hill and beyond. So there's a few things I want us to see 
which speak of what it looks like to live like an apostle. The first is this, expect opposition for Jesus. Many Christians, perhaps you know, friends, family members, loved ones, they get disheartened, don't they, when they realize that following Jesus doesn't turn out to be the bed of roses that perhaps they expected it to be. That it's not all plain sailing. In fact, it can often be quite the opposite. Well, that's what we see right here at the start of the early church. Crowds have gathered. The context here is, uh, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the healing of the man born lame who was laid at the gate beautiful, which is one of the inner gates of the temple. And he was laid there to beg for his living. And Peter and John go in there to worship and they pray for him and he's healed and crowds have gathered and the gospel is being pre preached. But we read here that the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees, they get involved and they come up because they are seeing the disturbance being caused by the apostles, by this amazing miracle. And they hear the apostles proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Now that upset the Sadducees, right? You remember in Jesus' day, you had the Pharisees. He mainly dealt with them, and they didn't get on too well. <laughs> but then you also had another group, another set, called the Sadducees. And the Sadducees were like the rationalists of their day. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They didn't believe in the more spiritual stuff. So they're upset at that message anyway. So they didn't know what else to do. So they seized uh, Peter and John, and they put them in jail. After all, the Sanhedrin, that's what this group is called, the priests, the elders, the teachers of the law, captain of the temple guard, the Sanhedrin are responsible for Israel's spiritual life. They oversee the temple, which is at the center of the national life of Israel. This is what we've got to get our heads around, folks. Get a Jewish mindset that God chose a people. He chose Abraham said, through you I will bless all the nations of the earth. And he established that faith. He didn't do this with any other nation under heaven. Israel, God's chosen people. That's the Jewish mindset. That's the mindset of these priests, these Sadducees, these teachers of the law as they come up. And they are, they are the ones responsible for keeping everyone in order, everything under control. And they have authority to do this. So they try and shut it down. Opposition comes to the word, to the gospel spreading. And yet, despite this, we read that the word spread. Isn't that awesome? That the men who believed, let alone women and children, the men who believed grew to 5,000. 3,000 came in on the day of Pentecost, but another 2,000 men came in, possibly on this day. This is Peter's third sermon in as many chapters. Who here would like to see more men in the kingdom of God? In the church of God. Hallelujah. We're expecting to see some women's hands go up there, ladies. Come on. Let's pray them in. And men, let's go and invite them in. For goodness sake. We have a message of hope that's life transforming. And even just for our sisters in Christ, we owe it to them. Loving our sisters, loving our neighbor looks like inviting more men to church. Sharing our faith with them. Anyway, don't get me on my hobby horse. So the next day, Peter and John are in prison. The next day, the Sanhedrin meet. And we read that the Sanhedrin includes Annas and Caiaphas. Remember them? Anyone remember their names? From just a few months earlier, they were the ones who tried Jesus of Nazareth. Annas. We read that Jesus is sent to Annas, who's the high priest. He's, he's the father-in-law. They keep it in the family back then. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas. But he had also been high priest. So Jesus goes to Annas, who then sends uh, Jesus to Caiaphas, who then sends Jesus to Pontius Pilate, who then sends Jesus to the cross. And this had all happened just a few months earlier. Now remember, we're keeping in mind the Jewish mindset. Uh, the Sadducees here, the Sanhedrin, they think they're protecting the faith. They think they're protecting Judaism from the enemies of God, from those who would corrupt their religion. After all, Jesus didn't look like the Messiah they expected, right? Messiah literally just means anointed one. And they anointed kings. If you were made king, David was anointed by Samuel with oil. So to be called the Messiah is to be called the king 
of Israel. The word Christ is Messiah in Greek, so they're interchangeable. But Jesus didn't look like the Messiah they expected. They expected an all-conquering king, didn't they? They didn't expect a king who would show himself to be arrestable, insultable, strikeable, spittable on, and even killable. That's not the king they expected. And it's because they didn't expect the Messiah to look like this that God is, is merciful towards them for killing his son. We read in Peter's previous sermon in chapter 3 that we looked at last week. Now, brothers, I know, speaking, rebuking these leaders, speaking of them, now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance. You, you did it in ignorance. You didn't know, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. In other words, Peter says, look, we've been misreading the scriptures. God always said that his king would have to come and suffer to enter his glory, to be the kind of ruler he's going to be. And yet still, as Peter says this, explains this, they don't get it. And so these leaders, the ones who should be leading them into truth and the fulfillment of the Jewish faith, which is to welcome their king, their Messiah, they are the very ones who begin to oppose the spreading of the gospel. And if we, the church today, which is what we're called to do and to be, if we are continuing in the line of the apostles, then we should expect opposition too. And the truth is that persecution isn't any less today than it was back then. In fact, it's more. Opposition, well, martyrs, Christian martyrs, there were more, it's hard to believe this, there were more Christian martyrs who lost their life for faith in Jesus Christ in the 20th century than there were in all the other previous centuries combined. Now, it's unlikely that we're going to get martyred, isn't it, here in Notting Hill? I don't know, depends what you get up to, but it's unlikely that we're going to experience such persecution. But we will experience opposition for Jesus when we go about lifting him up, exalting his name, declaring him to be the unique son of God. I mean, how does that go down in a multicultural society? It's challenging, right? People don't like it. They'll oppose it. How about the claim that Jesus is Lord and he should have lordship over our entire lives, over our finances, over our relationships, over how we use our bodies. Such a claim will be opposed. It's unpopular in a, in a culture of freedom and self-determination. And we will experience opposition to our ethics because of Jesus. Just think, just take your pick on ethical issues today and the Christian view will be unpopular and it will be opposed. And Acts shows us, folks, that those who would live like the apostles, which I hope you want to do and I want to do, that we should expect opposition for Jesus. That's the first thing we see from this passage. The second, to live like an apostle, is that we should be filled with the spirit of Jesus. We read that the rulers began to question them, Peter and John, saying, by what power or what name did you do this? We then read, then Peter, filled with the Spirit, said to them, Peter, our namesake for our church, the head of the apostles, the preacher, the first among equals, the one who said these words, the first to recognize who Jesus was, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is his third sermon, as I mentioned. And here's a key point that I want us to see that brings home what a great blessing we have, what an adventure we are on as the church of Jesus Christ in the 21st century to be called children of God. Because here's the key, key thing. What did Jesus' death on the cross achieve? It brought about the removal of sin, didn't it? Which in that moment brought about reconciliation between us and God, a holy God 
and a fallen sinful humanity brought together, reconciled in the person of Jesus Christ, God and man in one person. And in that reconciliation, we see the curtain in the temple is torn in two. Again, the Jewish mindset, folks. The temple was the place of God's dwelling and presence on earth. It's where the Holy of Holies was. Ark of the Covenant. Any Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones fans out there? That's what it's about. They were going after, trying to find God's presence. They had it all wrong. Their theology was way off in that movie. But now, because of Jesus, because of the day of Pentecost, when, remember, Jesus goes up, the ascension happens. Ten days later, Jesus goes up. Ten days later, the Spirit comes down. The Spirit of Jesus to empower his body, his church. And because of that, stick with it, folks. You, you, are you with me? You enjoying? It's rich. It's rich. Because of that, the church is now the place of God's dwelling and presence on earth. And who is the church? It's you and me. The book of Acts tells us that far from the temple now being the location and dwelling place for God's presence here on earth, you and me now are, if we're in Christ. Wow. That we get to be vessels of the Holy Spirit. That's why Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, can write here, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. So what's our primary calling as Christians? It's nothing less than to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And what's one sign that we are filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, it will be overflowing with words and proclamation to those around us. Saying things to them. Did you get that? Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. He began speaking. He used his voice. There's an incredibly unbiblical quote that gets misattributed, wrongly attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Perhaps you've heard it. It says this, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. Has anyone heard that expression before? Just strike it from your mind. It is completely unbiblical, and I don't think has the support of heaven or God the Trinity whatsoever. And St. Francis certainly never said it. He was one of the biggest preachers of his day. He did more preaching than anyone else. And why do I say forget about that expression? Because the gospel needs proclaiming. It needs explaining, right? We're hoping our loved ones, you have friends, you have family, you bring them to mind, people you want to come to know Christ, right? Come to know Jesus, come to faith. Everyone got someone in mind right now? Well, look, our job is to explain the events that have happened in the past. Jesus has come. He's died on the cross. He's risen again to new life. He's alive today, and he's coming back one day. These are historical events, other than the future ones I mentioned. But the cross and resurrection of Jesus is an event. But it needs an explanation. And when you get event and explanation, that is when you get revelation. You following me? This is why we need to use our words, because this is what our families need, our friends need, what our neighbors and colleagues need. And when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, folks, like Peter, then we cannot help but speak up and bear witness. So let me ask you, lovingly as your pastor, when was the last time you did that? When was the last time you spoke with a friend, talked with them about God or shared your testimony with a colleague or introduced the idea of faith into a conversation, into a discussion at the pub, whatever it might be. I've got a friend who he speaks of salty statements in our daily lives, in our conversations, having salty statements. This comes from the scripture that says, let your conversation always be seasoned with salt. You tracking with me? Jesus called us to be salt and light in the world. So when was the last time you spoke to someone you love about Jesus? And if it's not for a while and there's no condemnation, today is a new day, a fresh start, 
if it's not been for a while, then maybe you need to ask the Holy Spirit to come and fill you once again. In fact, it's just to be clear that the Holy Spirit, if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives in you. But we are leaky vessels and we need to, the Bible calls us to go on being filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you ask the Spirit to fill you, he's only too happy to do that. You know why? Because he's got no other temple to go to. <laughs> you are the temple of the living God. The temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. So he would love to come and fill you again. How do we get filled? Or well, we spend time with God in his word, praying, worshiping. If you struggle with the Bible, it's really hard to have a pattern of reading the Bible. I couldn't recommend more highly the Bible in one year. It's an app on your phone. You can take it everywhere you go. Read it on the tube to work. Set aside some time in the morning just to read a passage from the New Testament, to have an explanation of what you're reading, to build you up in your faith, to help the Holy Spirit come and strengthen you. Well, we've got a St. Peter's Worship Spotify playlist. We're going to put it on the group this week. So you can tune in and you can fill your head with good music. We went and listened to a bit of Adele last night in Hyde Park. Not in the gig. We sat outside the fences um, and uh, had a picnic. Anyone else go and do that last night? Almost as good, right? Almost. Very nearly. What's my point? My point is Adele's a great singer. Some great songs. Lovely to hear her music. But folks, there's nothing that comes close to filling your heads, filling our hearts with worship to God, allowing his presence to come and refresh us. So that's the second thing we see. If you want to live like an apostle, then be filled with the Spirit. Thirdly, minister in the name of Jesus. So be filled with the Spirit of Jesus and then go on to minister in the name of Jesus. It's not just what Peter speaks, it's what he says. Look at verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are, and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. They ask by what power, what name have you done this miracle? They say flat out, it is the name of Jesus. Our job as the church is never to take the glory, never to point to ourselves, always to point away from ourselves to the one who's done it all. And his name is Jesus Christ. It's not our gifts, it's not our abilities, it's all him. And what we see with Peter here is he's punchy preaching, isn't it? We've, this is his third sermon and each one have you noticed in each one he's like pointed the finger and said you killed him absolute idiots you crucified the messiah the king Cain, the one we've been waiting for you put him on a cross but god raised him from the dead all of peter's sermons there is the death and resurrection of jesus that he's alive and before we feel any sense of pride, like thinking, yeah, what idiots the Sadducees are, teachers of the law, they totally missed it, man. They didn't see Jesus for who he was. If we'd been in their shoes, we would have done the same thing. And the Bible tells us essentially that we are in their shoes because it's our sin that put Jesus on the cross. So don't go getting on your high horse. There's no room for pride in the church of God. All of us put it there. And this is the equation. We crucified Jesus, but God raised him from the dead. We sin, God forgives. Anyone happy with that equation? I know I am. Hallelujah. And Peter goes on to say, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone or the cornerstone. What is a capstone or cornerstone? It is the main stone you put at the joining of two walls when you're building a house. You want to build your house? You want to build the house of your life? You want to make sure you don't make a mess of your life? then you need to build those walls in straight lines. You need a capstone, a cornerstone. Peter says here that Jesus is that cornerstone, prophesied by all the prophets in the Old Testament. We just didn't see it, and we rejected him. But God has raised him up, and he's made him the foundation of everything. Peter goes on to say, salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. 
that word again. Salvation. I sometimes wonder if, as a church, and I mean a church around the world, have we lost sight of that simple truth that Jesus came to save? Do we still believe that salvation is necessary? Do we still believe that Jesus came to save us from the consequences of our sin, from separation from God in a place called hell, which is unbelievable? We live in a world that completely denies this reality that, that would seek to tell us that everything's all right. And because we swim around in that culture, we swim around in that soup, it rubs off on us. So we think, oh, everyone's fine. They must be fine, right? They look fine. And yet God's word tells us that we need salvation. And friends, salvation, salvation is not advice. It's not a helping hand. Oh, you're doing okay. Let, let me just give you a helping hand. It's not a partnership. We do our bit. God just gives us a little leg up. Ever need a leg up to get over a wall when you're a kid? It's not that. Salvation means that we are completely unable to do it ourselves. Salvation means nothing less than rescue from disaster. Speaking of the Bible in one year, there's a great story, illustration that illustrates this, that's found in it. It says this, Tony Bullimore, aged 56, was one of Britain's most experienced transatlantic yachtsmen. He was feared dead after his 60-foot yacht, Exide Challenger, capsized amid the icy vastness of the Southern Ocean, two months into the Vendée Globe round the world race. The keel came off in 50-foot waves. The boat went over. In his book, Saved, Bullimore described it as being like the Niagara Falls upside down. For four days, he was entombed in a dark, noisy, wet, and cold upside-down world with 50-foot swells and a temperature hovering around freezing. He suffered the discomfort of seasickness and drawing breath from a few feet of air between the water level and what was once the bottom of the boat. He was more than a thousand miles from the nearest land. As the air supply diminished, he prayed, he prayed that he would be rescued. It was the Royal Australian Navy that came to the rescue. With modern satellites and surveillance technology, the Australian government had pinpointed the progress of all the yachts and sent out a rescue team. After four days, Bullimore heard banging on the side of his yacht. He said afterwards, I can never thank the Australian Navy enough for what they have done because they have genuinely saved my life. There is no question. The first words when he emerged were, thank God, it's a miracle. He said, I felt like I had been born all over again. I felt like a new man. I felt I had been brought to life again. As one journalist put it at the time, a rescue that succeeds against all odds and every expectation is the best of all stories. It is pure and spontaneous joy. Supremely, Jesus gave himself for our sins to rescue us as Galatians tells us. Folks, that is the good news. That is the message of the gospel. That is what we are commanded to share, to speak, to proclaim to a world that desperately needs it. The biggest challenge for the church today is operating in a culture that tells us that we are fine as we are, that everyone's included. Now the church is all for inclusivity, folks. God invites everyone to come to him. All who are thirsty can come and take freely from the water of life. Jesus came for anyone and everyone. But it's on his terms and not our own. And the world, when the world tells us that we're fine as we are, that we're accepted as we are, that there's no need to change, no need for repentance or faith, well, that's a gospel without salvation. And that's a gospel, a different gospel to the one that the apostles held out. Peter's gospel, what we see here, the historic gospel of the church, says that we are only included when we understand that we were first excluded, all of us, because of sin. 
But the good news is that in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God's mercy has been poured out. And he is therefore able to say to each one of us, don't be afraid. You're no longer excluded. Instead, draw near. Come, take freely. And receive the free gift of eternal life. That's the message Peter delivers, folks. His third sermon in as many chapters. And that message is what rocked the Jewish faith back then. What rocked the Sanhedrin, these rulers we come across. Verse 13, we read that um, the rulers saw their courage and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. And when they realized that and saw that, that they were astonished. That word astonished is the same word used for when people saw the crippled man walking again, jumping up and praising God. They were astonished. Because the Jewish faith, if you were to operate in such power, you would need to go to the right school. It was all about authority and hierarchy. It was about study and training. And here are uneducated, unremarkable, normal people like you and me operating in great power. And they are astonished because it is a miracle. They see these men and they think, what a miracle that their lives can be so transformed. And the miracle today is that your life, my life, can be transformed too. How? How did they operate in this power? Well, the verse goes on to say this. They took note that these men had been with Jesus as I begin to come into land, that's the fourth thing we see about what living like an apostle looks like. It means spending time with Jesus. Are you looking for greater spiritual power in your life? Are you looking for courage? Are you looking for breakthrough in some area? Then the answer is always the same, my friends. Spend time with Jesus. Be it 15 minutes, 30, an hour, however long you like. Get alone with him into his word, in prayer, in worship, and he will meet with you. He'll speak to you. He'll fill you with his spirit. He'll rub off, rub off on us. I came across a lovely Persian proverb that says this, a lump of clay emitted a beautiful odor, and on being asked for an explanation, replied, I have been near a rose. Isn't that nice? Spend time with Jesus and you will begin to smell like him. You'll begin to resemble him and you will begin to impact the world around you. This is how the apostles impacted theirs. It made no sense. They were unschooled. They were ordinary. But we read here, such a good word whenever you come across it in the scriptures. So many good places in the Bible. Verse 13, but since they could see that the man who had been healed, they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. When someone's life is transformed, folks, it silences the voice of scoffers and doubters and cynics. There was nothing they could say. And friends, our lives and the fruit of our ministry should help silence the world around us. And it should raise lots of questions in them when they see us. Like, how can they have such joy? Where does your peace come from? Where do you find your hope? And the authorities didn't know how to deal with them. Verse 15, so they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. Verse 16 continues. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everybody living in Jerusalem knows they have done an outstanding miracle and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. The key expression there was, we cannot deny it. And yet, even though they couldn't deny it, they didn't accept it. And instead, they tried to stop it. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. They sought to intimidate Peter, a fisherman, John, a fisherman, ordinary people from a historic faith, a couple of thousand years old, with all the authority in that nation residing within them. They intimidated Peter and John. They said, enough, stop. They tried to crush and squash this fledgling church, hugely outnumbered, just three months old. I wonder if you sometimes feel the same in your Christian life with your friends, your family, your colleagues. We can feel it, can't we? Outnumbered, outgunned, unwanted, 
opposed. What should our response be? Well, what was Peter and John's? Verse 19, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. This is the final thing we see. To live like an apostle means to keep speaking about Jesus. The apostles stand their ground and essentially say, yeah, we, expect, we respect authority, but when orders from human beings clash with orders from God, there's only one response, and we must obey God. And what were those orders? The Great Commission from Jesus. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Guess what, folks? You cannot teach or make disciples without speaking in the name of Jesus. And when we feel pressured by society to be quiet, to stop talking about Jesus or sharing our faith, let's be honest, it can be scary and intimidating out there, can't it? When we hear those voices that would seem to command us not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus, we too must recognize that God has called us to quite the opposite. And we must go on speaking. And we must not keep silent. Because faith, faith comes through hearing. If we want to impact our culture and change it, then only our words can do that as we share the gospel with people using salty statements, allowing God to change their hearts. Peter and John go on preaching because they know God has commanded them to do it. But they also do it because they're excited about the truth. They say, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard, they say. And what had they seen and heard? They'd seen and heard the risen Jesus Christ, the physical, walking, talking, eating Jesus you remember that one? The one who ate a bit of broiled fish at one point. I've got a friend who became a Christian because of that one piece of evidence. He couldn't believe that a ghost would eat broiled fish. But we live in a world that must be told that it's true, that needs the testimony of those eyewitnesses. Peter, John, the other apostles. I'm trying to write a book at the moment, and I sent it off the other day to the publisher, and I got some notes back from them. And they're a secular publisher. It's amazing. They want to write a you know, publish a book about hope with me talking about Jesus all the time. And I share my story in it, and I talk about how I came to faith aged 18, and I came to realize that Jesus is, a, is alive. And one of the notes that she put in the margin to, to suggest an edit was, I wonder if this needs explaining for anyone new to Christian idea, ideas, i.e., not that he is alive in the human sense that he was once alive. <laughs> Do you get that? As in, maybe he's alive metaphorically. But that's the whole point, folks. Jesus really is alive. And there's no bigger or better news than that. And it's this excitement that carried the apostles through all the challenges and opposition that they faced because they knew it was true. And that can do the same for you and me, too. Like discovering a cure for cancer. You wouldn't keep it to yourselves, would you? In the earliest ch church, they knew the gospel and they shared the gospel which is what rocked the Jewish leaders to their core because they didn't know how to contain it. And as we close, verse 21, after further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. Wow, thanks, Luke. Um, lovely little insight just at the death there, just at the end. 40 years old, I mean, ancient, right? Who would expect a healing? A 43-year-old man. Um, anyway, that aside, this section ends with praise as it rightly should because God has done wonderful things through the name of Jesus. And the exciting thing for us today is he wants to do them with and through us too. So if you live like an apostle, my friends, expect opposition for Jesus. Be filled with the spirit of Jesus. Minister in the name of Jesus. Spend time with Jesus. And keep on speaking about Jesus. Because if we do that, we'll see God's kingdom come in greater measure. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together.